We'll just uh, wait a couple of minutes mm -hmm. before we start. Yeah. I, I think we can start now while the last uh, people trickle in. Um, so let me um, start by welcoming everyone from across civil continents to this uh, to this agrarian change webinar, which is as always organised by the Journal of Agrarian Change and the Department of Development Studies at SOAS University of London. I'm Jens Lerke from SOAS and from the Journal of Agrarian Change, and I'll be chairing the session. I'm also joined by two General Agrarian Change co-organizers, Sreya Sinha from Queen Mary University of London and Enrique Castagnon from uh, UCL. So welcome to you as well. So given the present political chaos in the UK, I can't help pointing out that the Agrarian Change Seminars uh, has been running stable and reliable seminars and webinars since 2008, year in, year out. So we, we have a slightly better record than what is the standard here in the UK right now. Um, but today we have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Gerardo Otero, Otero of Simon Fraser University in Vancouver as a speaker. Um, Gerardo, who is a sociologist and a political economist, is professor of international studies at Simon Fraser and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He has published widely, including in the Journal of Grand Chains, of course, and also including the books Farewell to the Peasantry, Political Class Formation in Rural Mexico, and of direct relevance to today's talk, The New Liberal Diet, Healthy Profits, Un Unhealthy People, uh, uh, published at the University of Texas Press 2018. So that takes us to the topic of uh, Gerardo's talk today, which is COVID-19, obesity, and the new liberal diet, how modern agriculture increases our health risks. After the presentation, my colleague, Sara Stevano, also from SOAS, will uh, provide some initial comments to start up our, our discussion. Sara works on the political economy of food, nutrition, inequalities, and social reproduction, especially in African context. <clears throat> The webinar is also live streamed uh, on our YouTube channel and you can post comments and questions in the live chat there and here uh, anytime. Also, we're going to record the session. So if you do not want to be recorded, simply don't use your audio and video. And finally, you can find the full program of our webinar and seminar series on our website, Agrarian Questions. So with that, let us start today program. Gerardo, over to you for the next up to 50 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jens. Uh, thank you very much, Jens. Uh, for me, it is a tremendous pleasure and an honor to have been invited to this uh, presentation. And uh, so I think uh, without further ado, I will be sharing my screen. I have quite a few uh, figures and graphs, data, 
to present to back up my statements. And uh, so uh, let me share my screen here. I guess I start with a bit of an infomercial here with uh, the cover of my latest book, the one mentioned by Jens already, uh, The Neoliberal Diet. But uh, this is the outline of uh, what I will be presenting. Uh, some words about uh, the COVID-19 and obesity, which uh, I think are directly related to the neoliberal diet in the sense that uh, obesity is uh, likely caused by the neoliberal diet. I haven't quite uh, demonstrated this yet, at least not in publication, but I have a very strong suspicion that this is not just a correlation, but a causation. Uh, and then the, I'll talk about the neoliberal food regime and its diet. Uh, and then um, I'll raise the question of whether food is a matter of choice or a matter that is structurally determined. Uh, and then, I, I mean, the, the latter will be my argument, of course, that this is more structurally determined than uh, being a personal choice. And then I will show some data to demonstrate uh, interstate inequalities and interclass inequalities, in this case, focusing in on Mexico. So the, the interstate uh, inequalities zoom into the North American Free Trade Agreement uh, region of the world. Uh, and uh, finally, I will offer some conclusions. So the COVID and obesity, you know, this has been, a, I guess, a very strange time of the world that uh, we were unlucky to, to live through. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, medicine is definitely not my area, but I did go over a large sample of medical uh, journal research uh, on this relationship. Uh, I explored about 25 to 30 articles. Here's just a small sample of uh, the kind of titles that I went through on obesity and mortality of COVID uh, meta-analyses. And I looked at articles on the United States, on China, on Mexico, and they all basically came to the same con conclusion that there is a, uh, obesity is a very strong risk factor for short-term mortality and adverse outcomes in Mexican patients with COVID-19. Uh, and so the link, the causal link here uh, goes, you know, from the neoliberal diet, which really enhances the likelihood or the risk of uh, becoming overweight or obese, and that entails greater health risks, um, including with uh, COVID-19, which really enhanced the possibility of uh, stronger uh, infections and possibly death. So uh, these are some brief data on excess deaths due to COVID-19. The highest number of estimated uh, excess deaths were as follows, 4.1 million in India, uh, in the USA, 1.1 million in Russia, also 1.1 million, even though it's a smaller country. So we'll see uh, what were the rates per 100,000 population so that things are more comparable. In Mexico, very high, almost uh, 800,000. Uh, similarly in Brazil, Indonesia, 736,000. Pakistan, 664,000. So uh, this is a more comparable kind of uh, measurement. In Russia, 375 deaths per 100,000 people. Uh, Etc. So Russia number one, Mexico number two, Brazil three, the USA fourth in uh, this kind of rate. So uh, moving on to the neoliberal food regime, what was the kind of research question that I had in mind when I started looking at diets? And I guess my question was, what are the social determinants of diets? for working classes under the neoliberal food regime. I should probably mention that uh, the first uh, 
colleague that called my attention to this uh, was Anthony Winson through his book, The Industrial Diet, which, which was published in 2013. And he establishes this link between food regimes and diets. Um, he kind of talked mostly about the second food regime. So since I was looking at the third, I try to figure out, well, what is the relationship between the third food regime, which I will be talking about soon. Uh, <clears throat> and my hypothesis was that class inequality conditions food choices more than individual preferences. So uh, let me start with the kind of aspirational goal of uh, food security, achieving food security for everybody. And this is when all people have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, innocuous, and nutritious food that satisfies their daily energy, food energy needs and preferences to carry out a healthy and productive life. And I guess if we go to the history of the concept, perhaps it harkens back to the notion of right to food, which was first mentioned by the UN in 1948, and food security as such uh, in 1974. Uh, so three food regimes were identified by Harriet Friedman and Philip McMichael in a seminal, seminal article that has been multi-sided since 1989, uh, published in Sociologia Ruralis. And uh, the first uh, food regime that they identified was uh, the extensive food regime with British hegemony from 1870 to 1914, the start of the First World War. And the two main crops associated with it were sugar and wheat. And uh, why was it extensive? Well, mainly because there were no significant technological innovations. And so the only way to expand agricultural production was basically to incorporate new lands to the agricultural frontier. And this was done by the British uh, through incorporating all the lands uh, from uh, its settler colonies, Canada, Australia. And the point was you know, to have these colonies send all these food items to the UK so the, the UK could become the manufacturing shop of the world. So workers there were devoted to manufacturing production and uh, while you know most of the food was imported. Now the second food, there was a transitionary period between the two world wars and after the second world war, there was uh, the emergence of the second food regime, which has been labeled uh, intensive, but also the surplus food regime. I'll explain momentarily what that's all about. And uh, now the hegemony changed from the UK to uh, uh, the US hegemony, and it was from about 1945 to 1980, and the main crops are sugar, wheat, and maize. So uh, I mentioned surplus, and that is because uh, this food regime did become uh, intensive thanks to a series of new technologies, new technological innovations that included, of course, uh, machinery, uh, irrigation, um, hybrid seeds in the case of corn or maize, and um, fertilizers, agrochemical uh, fertilizers, pesticides, and so on and so forth. And I mean, that, that is something that became uh, a very central uh, component. I mean, this technological package of what uh, in developing countries came to be known as the Green Revolution. So uh, I guess that, that was uh, the, the first extension of, uh, of this kind of agriculture into uh, developing countries. And finally, the third food regime was both intensive and extensive in the sense that, you know, it, it was really, I mean, at this point, the Green Revolution had uh, really taken hold. And so in that sense, extensive, but also intensive because uh, it was using all the technologies of uh, the modern agricultural paradigm, which included not only uh, by the third food regime, not only the technologies associated with the Green Revolution, but also biotechnology as the central uh, 
technological form in the neoliberal food regime. And I uh, locate this temporally in uh, the 1980s and associate it with the neoliberal turn. And uh, as you can see, each of the previous uh, crops of earlier uh, food regimes are incorporated in the new, excuse me, uh, the, the new, whoops, uh, the new um, crops in the third food regime are centrally maize and soybeans. And uh, I should clarify that these, these um, two crops are very centrally involved, not in direct consumption for humans, but in production of feed for livestock. And so that will have an impact on how the neoliberal diet uh, is uh, constituted. But before moving on to defining the neoliberal diet, let me say a few things about what I have proposed that the neoliberal uh, food regime constitute, cons consists of in terms of its dynamic factors. Uh, I have these four dynamic factors, state, agribusiness, multinationals, biotechnology, and supermarketization. Uh, I should point out that here I'm uh, establishing a distinction with uh, something that was claimed by uh, Philip McMichael, who talks about a corporate food regime. That's how he calls the third food regime, corporate food regime. I disagree with that characterization because uh, this part about corporate, it uh, highlights who are the main economic actors, but it... Uh, uh, hides from visibility the state because the way that uh, both Harriet and Mike Michael use the state is mostly as a unit of analysis in the world system, but they don't take the next step of moving the level of analysis downwards to, toward the nation state. And it seems to me like uh, within the nation state, we have to disaggregate the state and see how it acts to facilitate the neoliberal food regime. And so it is true that uh, the state changed its role from earlier periods. Uh, it no longer uh, directly participates in production, but uh, in, in the case of the neoliberal food regime, it has played a, a very central role in neo-regulation, uh, for instance, in the form of uh, a major strengthening of intellectual property rights. Why was that important? Because the central technological form of uh, the neoliberal food regime is biotechnology, which is very intensive in the use of knowledge, of research, and agribusiness multinationals are extremely interested in getting their uh, research protected intellectually so that people won't go out there and, and you know, copy their, their stuff. They want to be able to keep uh, patent rights for at least 20 years, which is you know, the usual legislation. And then, uh, so I guess I already mentioned that biotechnology is a continuation and deepening of the modern agricultural paradigm uh, you know, that is represented, for instance, in the Green Revolution. And then supermarketization in the sense that supermarkets are the key uh, distribution outlets uh, for uh, the products of, of this uh, uh, agriculture. And uh, in terms of food, and I will be disaggregating this, meats and energy dense foods are the hallmark of the neoliberal food regime. So let me move on then to what is the neoliberal diet? So <clears throat> mentioning again the research of my friend and colleague uh, from the University of Wealth, Anthony Winson, in his book, The Industrial Diet, I would say that the neoliberal diet is the globalized version of that uh, industrial diet. So the industrial diet, you could say, uh, emerged in the United States, but also in Canada. I mean, Canada followed the United States very, very closely in, in all these matters, in agricultural technologies, in, in the kinds of foods that were produced. And this comes from the 1940s. And uh, energy dense, ultra processed uh, kinds of foods are you know, very central. Uh, 
petrochemical use intensive. Uh, it is considered that agriculture contributes about uh, 30% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So you can imagine you know, how petrochemical use intensive agriculture is. And um, I think what makes uh, the difference between the neoliberal diet and what is popularly known as junk food is that the neoliberal diet contains both luxury and basic foods. By the way, by luxury and basic foods, I am not implying that they're necessarily more or less nutritious, okay? All I'm saying with these labels, luxury and basic, is that they are either more or less accessible economically. So it depends on your pocketbook which parts of the neoliberal diet you can access. So this is why I think uh, this kind of question, is food a matter of choice, is important because it so happens that the mainstream in the literature on food and nutrition, in North America at least, uh, tends to have a very individualistic focus. You know, the, the, the assumption is that individuals actually have a choice. And so we are called to vote with our forks, uh, to eating for change. And what I say is, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, inequality limits consumer choice. And I'm going to try to demonstrate this uh, structural argument with the uh, research I've done recently. So I'm going to move uh, into uh, interstate and class inequalities. And I will explain this particular image. I mean, why did I choose this image of cracked flags in the North American Free Trade Agreement? Well, because if you look at it, at least from the point of view of the working classes, they have not fared very well in terms of uh, the benefits from NAFTA. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some data in this regard. Uh, Kind of shocking data, actually. Uh, but before doing that, let me tell you what was the kind of uh, question that was being addressed in the early 1990s uh, when a developing society like Mexico was discussing the possibility of becoming uh, economically, commercially integrated into its two wealthier northern neighbors, the United States and Canada. And was there going to be an upward convergence toward the standard of living in the United States or perhaps a downward convergence toward the standard of living of Mexico or perhaps some kind of divergence? So to eliminate the mystery, <laughs> I will give you my short response here and I will be substantiating it uh, in the rest of the presentation. And my conclusion is that uh, there was a class differentiated convergence, meaning, you know, uh, upwards for the upper income classes and downwards for the working classes. How so? Well, let's, let's look into it. First, I'm going to show you some data on interstate inequalities. So these data are for the per capita gross domestic product in the three NAFTA countries. And these are all deflated data using dollars of 2015. They all come from the data set of the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, FileStat. And I'm comparing here with the world average, right? The, the per capita GDP for the world, which is the yellow line and the green line. And by the way, these colors uh, will repeat themselves. Blue will always be used for the United States, red always for Canada. And this is, you know, for the, the predominant colors in their flags, green in, in, for Mexico and yellow for the world. So as you can see, Mexico had almost always been slightly above the, the world until the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, when there was a decline 
And since then, Mexico has actually been below the per capita GDP uh, average. Uh, let me give you a bit of a warning also on this little thing I have here, which my students showed me how to do on Monday, because I did a, a trial run of this talk on Monday, and they asked me to, to indicate, whoops, to indicate that um, uh, there was a cut here. You know, I, I'm, I'm not starting from zero. I'm starting in this case from $4,000. And so that's what that little sign, red sign means, you know. Um, okay, in the case of Canada and the United States, they are kind of converging upwards, but with some distance taken between Canada and the United States in later years, perhaps in part because there is much greater inequality in the United States. So in spite of the fact that uh, uh, the GDP per capita appears to be a lot larger in the US, uh, given that there are many more fortunes in the United States, perhaps workers don't have such a different standard of living in the two countries. So these will give you a bit of a clue in that regard. What we have here is the share of labor compensation of the GDP. So the GDP equals one, and this share here is what goes to workers you know, from the GDP. And uh, as we can see, I, mean, I found this really interesting that uh, uh, Canadian workers were doing considerably better prior to the start of the North American Free Trade Agreement than after. Uh, in the case of the US workers, it's you know kind of flat. They did experience a bit of a bump here and we'll uh, zoom into that momentarily. In the case of the Mexican workers, you know, they're, they're really very bad uh, compared to their northern neighbors. And I should say that uh, even worse than Mexico are the Middle Eastern countries that are heavily oil exporting countries. In that case, workers only take about 17 to 19% of the GDP. So capital, of course, absorbs the rest. Uh, but let me, let me uh, present these same data in a different way uh, by making 1994 uh, 100%. So the question is, how were workers doing prior to 1994 and how were they doing after 1994? And so uh, again, you know, we do have this bump for US workers in the Clinton years, uh, you know, the 1990s were a fairly expansionary period for world capitalism. And, uh, you know, part of that improvement went to workers, but that declined uh, in the first uh, Bush, George Bush years. And I guess, uh, well, again, you know, we see Mexican workers going down pretty badly. I would say that this tremendous decline here has more to do with uh, a very substantial devaluation that happened in December of 1994. Uh, but the main overall message here is that workers in all of the NAFTA countries are doing worse off than they were doing at the start of NAFTA. All right. That's why I had those cracked flags there. Because at least from the point of view of workers, it hasn't been such a good deal. So let me now move on to the food performance for the North American countries once again, compared to the world average. So uh, what we have here is a presentation of kilocalories per capita per day. And uh, notice that the world average in the, and by the way, I'm using all of the data available in the uh, FAUSTAT, which starts in 1961 and goes to 2018. Um, and, Notice that uh, the world average was uh, 2,200 uh, kilocalories per capita per day. Mexico was close, but above that, and it's always been above that. And I will call your attention to, I guess, two or three main points here. One is this one, that uh, in the late 1970s and uh, early 1980s, 
Mexico had what was called the Mexican Food System, which was a government program to achieve food self-sufficiency. That was so successful that Mexico surpassed Canada in food consumption and almost reached the level of the United States. But after that, we had uh, you know, the indebtedness crisis, the lost decade of the 1980s for uh, most of Latin America, perhaps all of Latin America. And then there's uh, a little bit of recovery, but uh, you know, the, the peak for Mexican food consumption was 1981, and that level was not reached until uh, 2016, okay? Uh, so that's, I'm going to come back to Mexico momentarily, but first let me say that uh, Canada and the United States have converged upwards. Um, I guess, you know, after this period when Canada was beat by Mexico, so to speak, uh, Mexico, ex uh, Canada experienced a, a considerable increase in its food consumption. And I'm going to disaggregate what kind of food has Canada been consuming. Uh, because it's less obese than both Mexico and the United States. So we'll see why. Uh, but the third and last point I want to make here is that uh, a huge paradox emerges here. How come if Mexico has been so relatively stagnant in the number of calories ingested, why has Mexico become so overweight and obese, in fact, to become the number two country in the world after the United States. And I will say that the issue is that not all calories are made the same. Some calories come empty of nutrients and other calories come accompanied by fiber, vitamins, minerals, and so on. And so, uh, I will present, you know, just these very macro data to start on, uh, once again, NAFTA and the world. And this uh, has to do with proteins coming from vegetable products. And you will see that uh, Mexico had a much higher average uh, than even the world uh, through the late 1970s, you know, when most of its proteins were afforded by vegetable products, you know, almost 75% at the start. And at the end, it's, uh, oh, about 54%. Uh, so that's a major, major decline in, uh, uh, you know, proteins coming from vegetable products. And here is what I was mentioning about Canada. I mean, in, in this particular sense, I would say that Canada has done the best in terms of its association with NAFTA because it has uh, very significantly improved in terms of its uh, uh, consumption of uh, vegetable products to account for its proteins. The US has been mostly stagnant because you know, there's still heavy eaters of meat, like Canada is. I mean, Canada no doubt also eats a lot of meat. So let me uh, now move on to Mexico. And here I want to talk about class, interclass inequalities. So what I did here, I used to have a other way of analyzing this, uh, you know, with this kind of neat categorization of having the 10 uh, poorest percent on the one hand, the 10 richest percent on the other hand, and then look at the 40% uh, closest to the poor, the 40% closest to the rich. But then I noticed one particular piece of data that uh, the first, uh, well, let, let me, before I go on, let me explain that the data, and this comes from INEGI, the Instituto Nacional de Geografía Estadística e Informática. Maybe I said it backwards. Uh, uh, so uh, the Institute for the National Institute for Statistics, Geography, and Informatics. It's a very respected agency that conducts the census data and uh, yearly sur national surveys, nationally representative surveys uh, on many things, among others, uh, you know, the amount of uh, uh, family budgets or household budgets spent on food. Uh, 
And so what I noticed was that um, the first 70 or the seven, first seven deciles do not achieve even the average rate of income or the average income, national income. And so I figure, well, then the better way of classifying this is by, you know, putting the poorest 10% here and then the next 60%, you know, from 11 to 70, and I call them medium poor. And then the next 20%, which I called medium rich, why do I put them over here? Because they do, you know, both of these deciles do earn more than the average national income. And of course, the 10 reaches 10%, which, you know, receive much more than the average. So um, I guess uh, the message of this particular graph is that the poorest 70% were having to spend more on food than their peers in the 30% of higher income. Whereas, um, well, these people here actually had to spend a little less. And that is the desirable trend, you know, that people will increasingly spend lower shares of their budget in food. There was no change for the richest 10%. Uh, mind you, 13% from the richest means a lot more money than, you know, even 55% for the poorest. Okay, and I will be zooming into this reality momentarily. So this is um, <clears throat> the average, oh, I can't read my graph here. Oh, average household income as <clears throat> percent of the richest 10%. So here I'm making things relative to the richest uh, this aisle. Uh, I mean, I took, the income in absolute numbers for each of the, uh, you know, the 10% decile. And then I divided the incomes of all these other deciles by the income of the richest. And this was the result that, uh, well, the poorest have around 5% up to 6% of um, what the rich take. Uh, the medium poor, you know, less than 20%. The medium rich, around 40%, a little more than that. Uh, there's some interesting trends here, and I'm I'm a bit puzzled because I mean these data, uh, the, the yellow data anyway, do come from 2020. So what we see here from 1984 to 2002 is that there was a bit of a decline, and this decline unequivocally means that there is deepening inequality, all right? So if that is the case, what does this slight jump mean here between 2002 and 2020? Well, it could mean that inequality has decreased very slightly, all right? The other question is, has this decline taken place in the latest two years of the administration of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador? Well, that would be great for him, I guess. Uh, the fact is that income has been reduced, but the Gini coefficient has been improved, has decreased, all right? So it could be that uh, an important chunk of this increase or decrease in inequality has to do with some of the policies, for instance, increase in uh, minimum wages, a very substantial increase in minimum wages, during the uh, this Manuel Lopez Obrador administration. Um, so these are Mexico's top 10 food sources in terms of kilocalories per capita per day. And here I'm comparing, uh, you know, the year when Mexico ingested the, the highest amount of food. 2019 was a slight decline because I mentioned that 2016 was the first year after 1981 when Mexico achieved the same number of average kilocalories per capita per day. But what's been the change in composition? That's the main question in this uh, chart. Well, you know, there's been a, a slight decline in maize, a very slight decline in sugars, a more significant decline in wheat, a slight bump in milk, about the same in pork, uh, 
a very substantial increase in me in uh, chicken meat, which is why I call chicken the neoliberal diet. All right, and I'll probably explain more about that later. Um, and so soybean oil, you know, this is also a very important increase because what this means is that Mexicans are eating a lot more fried stuff. And that definitely contributes to overweight and obesity. And a very significant decline of beans. You know, so this is very consistent with that long-term decline in uh, vegetable products contributing to protein intake. An increase, however, of eggs. Mexico is the highest per capita uh, eater of eggs and an increase in beer. So I'm calling beer the neoliberal alcoholic drink, whereas wine would be the luxury drink, at least for all those countries that do not have a wine tradition like uh, France, Spain, Italy. So let me move on to fruit. You know, how much do households spend on fruit? Once again, as a percentage of the expenditures of the richest decile, all right? Uh, given the numbers here, I consider fruit as the most luxury product. In fact, there's something else that's more luxury, and that is the amount of uh, the household budget spent on out-of-home expenditures, all right? But in terms of food items, fruit is definitely the most luxury item. Um, and once again, you know, uh, the richest diesel is the 100%, and all of these are the shares, you know, so uh, the poorest 10% spend 32 cents for every dollar or every pound spent uh, by the richest diesel, 46 cents, 66 cents, etc. Now beef, beef is the second uh, most luxury food item. Um, I don't suppose I need much more explanation there. But then we start with um, uh, what I call basic. And I'll tell you what my criterion is to designate luxury and basic in this context. If the poorest 10% spend 50% or more of what the richest spent, that makes the product a basic product, okay? So in this case, we have vegetable, legumes, and seeds. Obviously, all of these are very healthy products, but given income inequality, the poorest can only spend a small fraction of what the richest spend on that. That amount by the medium poor, that amount by the medium rich. Next, we have alcoholic beverages, which if you look two years earlier, alcoholic beverages would have been luxury because it was only about 46%. Uh, the amount of expenditures by the poorest of what the richest uh, spent. But now, I don't know if this has anything to do with the pandemic or what. I mean, 2020 is the year of the pandemic. Uh, maybe people drank a little more, but they were spending over 50%, the poorest. Um, still, uh, I don't discount the possibility that uh, in, spite, in spite of the fact that they're spending less, they could be consuming similar amounts of alcohol, but just cheaper types, right? Perhaps the wealthier are only buying their whiskey, whereas here they're buying much cheaper kinds of alcohol, beer, for instance. Uh, here we have poultry. And once again, this is the reason why I call poultry meat the neoliberal meat or chicken meat. It's mostly chicken, I mean, it includes turkey, but I mean, the lion's share is chicken meat. So, um, and here we have eggs, <clears throat> once again. Um, Mexico is the highest per capita consumer of eggs. 
And so it's not surprising that the poorest uh, decile spends 68 cents for every dollar or every peso of the richest decile, uh, etc. cetera. The, the medium rich spend very close to the same amount as the richest uh, decile. Sugars. Uh, you know, I try to mimic uh, the colors, you know, sort of. So sugars, you will notice that the poorest 10% spend even more than the medium poor. And the medium rich, well, you know, they, they spend uh, closer to, to the uh, richest 10%. But now look at this, uh, what happens with tortillas. You know, what happens with tortillas really indicates that um, the poorest deciles have to spend a lot more money on tortillas than even the wealthiest uh, decile, the richest decile. The poorest 10%, they cannot even afford to spend the same amount as the richest. Uh, but if you look in previous years, for instance, 2016, uh, these figures are a lot higher, actually. The poorest were spending about uh, the same as these guys here. And these uh, two groups were spending about 136 or 36% more than the richest decile. So you can see that uh, tortillas are perhaps the most important vehicle for caloric consumption in Mexico. So conclusions, and I'll have two slides on this. The first one is that uh, the medium rich and the richest classes are spending more money on meat, fruit, and vegetables. And in parentheses, because I haven't uh, substantiated this, and I would say with wine, uh, the poorest and the medium poor classes are spending more on chicken and energy dense or ultra processed foods and beer. Another set of conclusions here, Mexico has the highest rate of COVID-19 deaths on a per 100,000 basis. And so my overall message, I guess, is stop blaming the victim because that emanates from a very individualistic focus on the analysis. And uh, it's very problematic because it can also lead to mistaken policy recommendations. I will give you one example of <clears throat> a policy, uh, a law actually, that was passed in France some time ago uh, to the effect of uh, shaming children that were gaining a little too much weight. So not only you know, is that uh, taking the individualistic assumption seriously, but it's constituting overweight and obesity as uh, something that uh, individuals are to blame. And individuals can change when in fact, most likely they cannot change it, especially children. I mean, children eat whatever their parents uh, put on their tables, right? And so, uh, I consider that to be an extremely tragic kind of outcome. Um, I think uh, overweight and especially obesity has become another basis of oppression, just like gender has been, like uh, race and ethnicity have been. So we really need to stop blaming the victim, look at the bigger picture that it's structure and not personal choice that matters. And so what do social movements demand? In Mexico, at least, they want food sovereignty, regeneration of the countryside, and the preservation of biodiversity or biodiversity conservation, and the introduction of agroecological methods of production. And I guess that applies particularly for ecological movements that are uh, getting close to peasant movements. And that's it for me.
Thank you so much. And I'll do the clapping for, for everyone. Now, uh, that, was, that was really interesting. Both, both the, the evidence, the details, and the, uh, the, the, the arguments, class differentiated convergence, uh, the, the uh, obesity as oppression, etc. But I will not say much because, as I as I said at the beginning, uh, I will leave it to Sarah to to uh, to to give a uh, to 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 highlight a number of issues for for discussion and 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 consideration. I I should have said that Sarah has also worked on COVID uh, quite a bit in the last few years, so there are connections there as well. Um, before I do this, so, so let me just set out. So, so after Sarah's uh, uh, intervention, we will go to the question and answer session. Do use your uh, the hand to um, uh, raise a hand if you want to 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 contribute to the discussion. You can also put questions in writing in the chat here. And those of you that are that are uh, watching this on YouTube can also put questions on the chat there, we will monitor that. Uh, both my, uh, myself, Enrique and, and Shreya will keep an eye on things. But over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Jens, and thank you so much, Gerardo, for this uh, very interesting presentation. I think we share um, quite a few research interests, uh, so it has been uh, fascinating and also very useful for me to engage with your work and listen to the presentation. So I would like, I will keep this very brief, but I would like to start by saying that uh, from my perspective, the notion of the neoliberal diet is very powerful um, to capture how dietary change is taking place across the world. And it's, I find it particularly useful uh, to put in connection elements that are not very often put into dialogue in the literature which are on the one hand of what people eat and in particular what individuals eat and what households food practices look like um, with the structures and the configuration of uh, food regimes uh, and how we have macro systemic changes uh, in uh, food systems. And I think that very often when we think about the food and nutrition, that connection between what happens in uh, everyday lives uh, or what I come from the discipline of economics, so what we would call in uh, microeconomic observations, uh, is not put in dialogue with those systemic macro processes. So, so the concept of the neoliberal diet is uh, very powerful in that sense. And I think uh, what uh, your colleague Winston did with industrial diet uh, also paved the way in that direction. And I found that work also very useful. Um, and what I think is also great is that uh, you're placing the emphasis on quality, uh, which I think is a very important aspect of understanding some of these issues, so particularly the contemporary world. And of course, I am very sure that in this particular virtual room, nobody needs to be convinced that we need to uh, move away from a focus on individuals. Uh, but I do think that in the world of food, uh, these calls uh, need to uh, still have a very important role to play because uh, we do have uh, not only uh, research, but also policies uh, that continue to focus on the individual as uh, the key, key site uh, where we can uh, essentially create a change uh, when it comes uh, to food uh, and nutrition. So that is very important. Um, and uh, I also very much like uh, how you link all of this uh, with a picture on inequality, which is another um, huge uh, contemporary and not only contemporary, but it has become more noticeable to a wider audience in more recent years, uh, uh, the, like this situation of uh, growing inequalities uh, at multiple scales uh, and of multiple kinds. So my I have a few questions that I would like to put to you, and they are mostly about uh, unpacking a little bit more uh, this uh, story about inequality, because I think uh, from my perspective, the there is probably something more to be said in, uh, um, in that respect. So the first question is about the fact that uh, from uh, my understanding of your characterization of the neoliberal diet, uh, this is characterized as fundamentally originating in the US and being a kind of diet that then sort of spread in other parts of the world through processes of globalization. And in a way that is in line with the hypothesis of nutrition transition that is also very much used in the literature uh, that suggests a kind of fairly linear process of change. 
in how dietary transformation is taking place uh, in different parts of the world. Um, and I would like uh, to get your views on this, because from my perspective, looking at uh, diets uh, and food practices, uh, for example, in some African countries, uh, I think that there are some characteristics of uh, contemporary dietary transformation in these countries uh, that are very unique um, to the specific roles, for example, that the food industry plays in these countries. Uh, and therefore, I would not think of that process of change uh, in a linear way. I would think that there are some specific features so that we need to account for uh, in a more accurate manner. And this links uh, to um, a second uh, point and question that I would like to put to you, which uh, has to do with uh, the fact that what we see today in countries such as Mexico, in fact, in Mexico, not only today, but uh, in uh, the sort of uh, middle income countries across the world, uh, if we want to use this category, is uh, a very fast pace of dietary change, uh, um, which needs to be accounted for somehow. And I think it is different from the type of dietary change that took place in higher income countries uh, some decades ago. So there is something that is peculiar to what is happening in middle income countries in the past decade and today, but also we know very little about low-income countries so because the data is very scarce for those countries, so that does not mean the dietary change is not taking place and that has unique features. So, so again, you know, like if you could uh, basically comment a little bit on, uh, on this. And finally, um, so you placed the emphasis on class. Uh, what I saw from your empirical analysis is that uh, you mostly focused on uh, income classes uh, or income categories. Uh, and I suspect that ha that has to do with uh, the data that is available and the type of analysis that is allowed by the data. But if we were to pursue further research uh, using a class analysis in a more sort of granular or detailed way, um, what are the additional factors and dimensions that you think uh, we would need to look at in addition to income in order to understand the, the differentiated impacts uh, of dietary change? Um, so these are my three questions to you, but thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. Should we, should we start uh, with, with some tentative replies from you, uh, Gerardo, and then open the floor afterwards? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. <clears throat> Let me uh, comment uh, briefly on, on each of those points. Um, I guess, uh, yes, you're right that income inequality has become extremely uh, prominent in the discussion. I guess uh, this came to the fore after the um, uh, Occupy Wall Street movement. And then uh, with uh, Thomas Piketty's intervention in 2014 with Capital in 21st Century, and then his capital in ideology, his latest book this year, which I'm using in my course now, on a, a brief history of equality. He tried to uh, overcome the pessimism that he was accused of in, uh, on the first book to try to say that, well, you know, things are actually getting maybe a little bit better uh, on some grounds. But uh, I mean, the data that I present, I think, uh, are fairly unequivocal that inequality is extremely persistent in Mexico. And I mean, things are in fact getting a little worse uh, uh, on some uh, measurements. But um, uh, on the question of the transition to the neoliberal diet, I think you're very correct in, in pointing out that Mexico uh, experienced a very quick transition. And I think that had to do with uh, well, the, the, with the kind of neoliberal turn that happened in Mexico at the end of the 1980s, uh, Carlos Sanilas de Gortari was the main priest of neoliberalism, so to speak, in that, uh, you know, he was the main economic minister from 1982 to 1988, and then he became president from 1988 to 1994. And he started uh, a lot of the neoliberal reforms uh, in the 1980s. I would say that 1986 was the, the entry point when Mexico joined the general agreement on, on tariffs and trade. And, that, uh, and then unilaterally, Mexico in preparation for NAFTA, it unilaterally opened its borders uh, uh, to agriculture. 
And so Mexico immediately started importing a lot of corn. And, and so the, the, the chicken uh, part of production, uh, I mean, if you look at the, the data on, on how chicken production and consumption increased, it, it's uh, staggering. It's like uh, exponential curves. And uh, initially both from importing chicken, you know, already produced chicken, but also importing a lot of the feed, you know, the soybeans, the, the maize to produce chicken internally in Mexico. Now, a lot of it is produced in Mexico, but, but still, I mean, Mexico is consuming a lot of chicken. And um, I guess in social, in class terms, what happened is that uh, the peasantry in Mexico, which had traditionally been devoted to supplying basic foods, they were basically bankrupted. Many of the people that constituted uh, the peasantry left as migrants to the north. And, and that's why I've claimed in an article of 2011 that Mexico lost not only its food sovereignty, but also its, food, its labor sovereignty in the sense that Mexico stopped being able to produce decent living jobs for a majority of its population so that too many people had to migrate. I mean, between 2000 and 2005, uh, there were more migrants or more people expelled from Mexico than there were people expelled from India or from China, which are countries that are more than 10 times bigger than Mexico, right? So on a per capita basis, Mexico is a major expeller of labor force. So in that sense, Mexico lost both food and labor sovereignty. And right now, Mexico still imports about 60% of its uh, basic foods while exporting masses of fruits and vegetables to the United States. And this tremendous dependency, not just on the importation of basic foods, but also on the exportation of luxury fruits and vegetables is making those items much more expensive in Mexico, right? Because the more capitalist farmers, uh, which are the only ones that can afford to produce uh, fruits and vegetables, they find it a lot more interesting to sell to customers with yens or with dollars, uh, Canadian or American. So, um, and on the classes, I'm not sure, you know, but you're right. I mean, uh, the, the classes I present are definitely income categories of classes. Uh, I'm not sure how that would translate to more analytically derived uh, classes, you know, by their relations to the means of production, the property of the means of production, et cetera. Uh, that would be, I guess, more complicated to do. And we probably don't have the data. Uh, although I'm thinking Inehi actually does produce a lot of data on income sources, you know, whether they come from, from, sal from wages or from small businesses and so on and so forth. So it might be possible to come up with more analytically oriented uh, classes. I haven't done that research though. So I'm, I'm uh, gonna take advantage and, and to answer uh, Anne Murcott, who in the chat was wondering why I included innocuous. So I wanna clarify that that definition of food security is not mine, it's the official definition in almost all of these super state organizations having to do with food, uh, you know, the FAO the, or the FAO, I mean, uh, the ILO. Uh, there's a kind of a single official definition of uh, food security uh, from the UN. Thanks so much. Let us, let us continue with Anna. Anne, sorry, Anne Mercot, please. Thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed your talk and thank you for giving me um, the floor for a minute. Um, I, I didn't remember that innocuous was in those de definitions. It's clearly you know, my failing memory. So thank you for the, for the reminder. Um, but I have a question too, because unfortunately, I, I, I think your, your, the burden of your talk is dismally all too familiar. Um, I mean, we've known about such uh, um, relationships between diet and income. Uh, for 100 years it's been studied and obviously it's a lot older than that 
Um, and it, and also, you know, the whole problem of the individualistic outlook contemporarily and the blaming the victim, that's rampant in this country too. I mean, my experience of working with um, as a, uh, a member of a committee is advising the UK Food Standards Agency. I mean, we're fighting this individualism the whole time and getting nowhere with it. Um, and certainly your, your uh, hypothesis of, I, I, I think you called it a hypothesis, forgive me if I'm, I'm, I've got that wrong, but your, your arguments that um, uh, the, the high, high rates of, of COVID are, are um, a result of uh, such huge uh, in, inequalities in diet. Um, it's immensely plausible and an attractive um, hypothesis, uh, but I do wonder though whether uh, it remains only a correlation rather than something closer to cause. Because until you, until you, I think until you can conclude that what you presented um, amounts to more than correlation and is closer to cause, you would have to rule out all kinds of other features about the COVID data. Uh, you'd have to rule out um, the nature and the quality of those data and the variability between nation states. You'd have to rule out other factors associated with pandemic spread of COVID within and between nation states. And also have to talk about the effectiveness of public health measures um, and the variability between nation states and the effectiveness or otherwise of whatever measures were taken, which clearly they weren't the same worldwide. Um, and so that before you'd have to rule all those out before you can securely um, point to a, a causal link between the neoliberal diet and, and, and uh, such horrible high death rates uh, from COVID. Am I being unfair or, or uh, please, I'd like to hear your view. Uh, no, I think uh, you are right. Uh, I think the only possible claim I have, but I think still is a hypothesis. I mean, I do have some measurements, not uh, of uh, the causality between uh, obesity and COVID, but between the neoliberal diet and obesity. I mean, I did run an econometric model uh, using 16 countries with many points, uh, you know, that, that make for a panel data. And uh, they do seem to indicate costs between neoliberal diet, yeah, neoliberal diet and obesity, okay? I haven't published that yet uh, because I had some doubts about some of the data. I mean, I did this with a, a colleague, you know, an economist, econometrician and so on and so forth, but I, I feel like there might be some problems with the data. So until I corroborate that, I will feel more confident in stating this as a, a causal argument. I think we're very close to that. Uh, now, the causality between, um, so I, I think we, if we establish that uh, the neoliberal diet does cause obesity, then I think the medical literature has taken care of establishing an extremely strong correlation between obesity and COVID, uh, uh, you know, really bad COVID or lethal COVID. So uh, it wouldn't be for me to prove it, but uh, I mean, my reading of the medical literature is that uh, there most likely is cost. I'm not sure what kind of uh, uh, methodology you would have to use to prove causality there. But uh, I mean, I would leave that for medical researchers to establish that. Yeah. But I think they, they would be on a good path, you know, to, with these kind of hypotheses. Yeah, surely. I mean, the epidemi epidemiology shows that it, it, it's highly correlated, but that's yeah. not the same as cause. The sure. Yeah. That, you know, the problem is getting the clinical data. Right. Okay. I, interesting, but uh, also difficult to solve. It, it does sound as if uh, your your recent data, uh, Gerardo, will be able to show strong correlation at least. So 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 that that is interesting. Uh, I have a question myself, uh, which is sort of going back to, to, to the discussion of the role of food industry, which, which, uh, which you touched upon, in, uh, particularly in, in, your, in, your, in the discussion 
it, uh, how the, the imports uh, from the US had changed the food diet in Mexico and how farmers in Mexico had been outcompeted and, and production had changed. So, so if you were to, to, to uh, so expand on that, so, so you're putting the, 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 the drive of a change here on the food industry. I'm asking because you earlier you were you were discussing uh, the the third food, food regime and you were you were suggesting it was too simple to focus to call it the the corporate food, the food regime. So so how how do these two aspects relate to each, each other? And and maybe while you're at it, we can we can add the the, the question from the from the from the chat from Artur. Are food movements having some impact on on agriculture and food situation, because that's sort of the other side of the same issue, isn't it? Right. <clears throat> yes, I, I believe I mentioned uh, initially in my talk uh, about my disagreements with uh, Phil McMichael that uh, if we don't uh, lower the level of analysis from the world economy to a meso level, uh, including uh, the state, we will miss this uh, very important variable of that I call neo-regulation. And, uh, and I guess, uh, you know, uh, my view is that the each na nation state is the one that implements the policies that enable the neoliberal turn and enable the possibility that uh, agribusiness corporations uh, take the upper hand. And I mean, I'll give you one example, not on, on agribusiness multinationals, but on supermarkets. I mean, before 1992, Walmart was not even present in Mexico. Since 1992, Walmart, and I'm you know, with figures from about 10 years ago, Walmart Mexico was producing about 20% of the global income for Walmart. Now, and these are figures from this year, Walmart controls about 64% of all the food distributed in Mexico. And the next one, which is actually from my hometown, Soriana, that's another major supermarket. I know, you know some of the owners, uh, they control a mere 16 and a half percent. And the next one controls four, two percent, something like that. Uh, so, I mean, this is a, an extremely, I, this is already a, a virtually monopolistic kind of, uh, domination of the market by Walmart in Mexico. And so what kind of food is transmitted through these supermarkets? Well, you know, it's it's really the uh, processed, ultra processed uh, foods, um, a lot of it from the United States. And I guess another side that I haven't studied directly is, uh, but something that I, I confronted, you know, the last time I was in, in Monterrey, which is, you know, the largest, the second largest industrial city in Mexico, well, maybe third after Guadalajara. Um, I have relatives there and, and we went to this shopping mall and I was looking to get some Mexican food. So I was looking for Mexican restaurants. They were nowhere to be found. All you could found, find were U.S. franchises of uh, restaurants. I was shocked in Monterrey, no Mexican food in the mall. So, I mean, the, but yes, I mean, Sarah is right that, you know, this was a very quick transition. And, and, and you can see this, I mean, because the neoliberal diet becomes literally incorporated into people's bodies. You can see it. Thank you. Um, so let us let us move to the chat. Um, there are some questions in the chat. Enrique, will you will you uh, take them, please? Hi. Um, sure. Uh, I can see one from Juan Jose. So I'm I'm going to read it. It's, it's kind of it does have a, a bit of a, of an intro there. Um, okay. So he's interested in, in knowing about structural conditions, Gerardo. So if a structural conditions determine food consumption, as as you implied. What could be the reasons that strategies such as food labeling in Mexico uh, fall in the end or the decisions on food choices of, of consumers, right? So that's sort of, um, again, the, this tension between the structure and, and, and decisions and, and choice, if, if you want. 
Um, so that's from Juan Jose. Well, there's a second question from him as well. Does it obey the same structural conditions of the neoliberal food system in Mexico? So I think that that's one topic. The other one, I think it's a comment by Anne. Uh, and uh, yeah, just Ruth asking if we can have the slides. Well, that's, I, I suppose we, we can. Um, yeah, and it's just more uh, comments and info from Anne just to complement your previous discussion. But I do have my own question, if that's fine. It's just very mm -hmm. quick. Um, it's just a while ago with, with colleagues in, in Latin America, we just been discussing what if we do an experiment and we stop using the, the word neoliberal for a while, you know, what, what, what could happen? Because in Latin America, I suppose uh, elsewhere, we do use this uh, and a lot and, and for good reasons, of course, I don't want to downplay, you know, structural adjustments and kind of things that, that we, we know um, characterize globalization. But I think it's interesting, what, what if we take a step um, to the side and try to look to what extent we're overusing the word that much? And I'm not suggesting that you are, but what I would like to push you a little is just to ask you if you can elaborate on the neoliberal diet, because you said it's different from an agroindustrial diet. And you said that because it's, it's globalized, but uh, if you can tell us a bit more, I mean, what, what is the exact neoliberal content in this uh, diet? Um, yeah, that would be for me. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me first address the issue of uh, labels and uh, perhaps even the the taxes introduced in, in Mexico in 2013, I think it was, uh, for uh, sugary soft drinks. Uh, both are definitely inspired by the individualistic uh, perspective. Um, I think in the case of the taxes, I mean, they are definitely hated by the soft drinks companies uh, because it can result in lowering their sales. Uh, I don't like them either because I think it really penalizes the poor the most uh, because the poor access, uh, you know, these uh, sugary soft drinks, not just because it may be safer than drink water from the tap, you know, because there's a lot of places where potable water is not readily available, but also because it is the cheapest uh, vehicle for, for calories. So even if these are uh, empty calories, well, you know, that, that's about as far as they can go. And I mean, one example of this tragic example is the state of Chiapas in Mexico, which is one of the poorest. I just read the figure the other day uh, that uh, in Chiapas, they consume five times as much as the national average of uh, sugary drinks. I mean, that, that's horrible. And, and I mean, you can see mothers feeding their babies with Coke or Fanta or something like that, you know, in, in the bottle. I mean, they're still suckling. Um, now, in terms of the food labels, I think it's, uh, it's okay, but it will favor primarily the top 10%. Uh, why do I say that? Well, because I mean, there have been studies uh, by some critical food studies people in North America, uh, like um, Marion Nestle, Nestle, for instance, that, uh, uh, you know, cause there's also the argument that, well, we need more education, you know, to, to tell people what's good for them. But these studies show that if people don't have the access, it doesn't matter if they know what's good for them and what's bad for them. They simply can't buy it. They can't afford it. So if, if if you don't reduce inequality, if you don't improve the food system, you know, reduce the current incentives to produce ultra processed food, et cetera, you're not gonna change the kind of food that's available for people. So we need to really address food system change and inequality change. Um, oh, and, and uh, what's the value added, if any, of using neoliberal, as uh, Enrique was asking. Uh, that's a tough question, because I mean, I, I think the word neoliberal appears in most of my books, actually. <laughs> so, I mean, you take that out and my, all my titles are gonna kind of fall apart. Um, but I guess the, the value added of this, uh, at least in regard to the neoliberal food regime, to the neoliberal diet, is that as far as I can tell, 
it is the neoliberal policies that have generated this kind of uh, food regime, this kind of diet. And so I think that calls the attention to people in social movements, particularly the people in social movements, right? Because they are the ones that can exert some level of agency. Individuals for me, no, they can't. I mean, unless they have the means to do it. Uh, so it's only collectively empowered people that can nudge the state to change things. And one needs to be changed, neoliberalism. So, I mean, in Mexico, we currently have a government that claims to come from this party of movements, you know, the Morena, Movimiento de Regeneración Nacional, Movement for National Regeneration. It's supposed to be made up of a number of social movements. Now it's kind of moving into becoming a party of state. That's another discussion. But uh, while it was a party of movements, I would say that you know, that's, uh, I mean, that's why the, the current government has uh, uh, a policy to try to recover food self-sufficiency, at least on five items, you know, uh, maize, uh, beans, wheat, rice, and milk. It's very limited because, I mean, the FAO records about a hundred different food sources, right? So if you're focusing on five, well, you know, that's a start, but... Uh, the fact is that the current rate of inflation of food doubles the general rate of inflation, all right? So obviously the, the government's efforts have been very insufficient. And I would argue that there need to be much stronger efforts, not only on the very basic uh, caloric foods, but also on, on fruits and vegetables and try to institute uh, government programs, or excuse me, programs in schools to provide kids with at least one meal, preferably two or even three meals a day. Because if we start with child, uh, childhood, we're going to ensure that we have you know, a better future for Mexico. And it starts with food, you know, really good food so that people, so that children can learn better. Thanks. Um, Sreya, you have a question? I, I do have a question. Thank you, uh, Gerardo, for such a, a fascinating talk. Um, so I have a couple of questions. My, one of my questions actually was similar to Enrique's question, like, why is this a neoliberal diet? And, you know, I, I suppose as an extension and just to be a little bit provocative, uh, is there a case for just a capitalist diet in some sense, you know, or capitalist diets? Or, or do we need that kind of... Um, you know, you need that neoliberal content to to signify a particular moment in the trajectory of capitalism. And, and if you could sort of spell out uh, like more explicitly what, what that might be. Um, and then my second question was, uh, was actually more about the politics. So just now, uh, of course, in your presentation, we, we saw that, you know, you talked about food sovereignty towards the end. Uh, but um, like right now, just now that when you were talking, you were talking about different kinds of programs also for children and in schools. And so I wonder if there is a kind of, you know, there is a politics somewhere in between the neoliberal diet and food sovereignty uh, that also needs to be kind of encouraged, which I don't know if it is, has to be about regulation or it is kind of more, you know, it, it, it's less radical in some sense than food sovereignty. Or do you see it all as part of the same uh, politics, uh, if, if you know what I mean? Um, and then a third question, I think it just... Um, there's a lot of kind of um, in the food system scene. I think there's a a, a lot of discussion now on uh, not just on food security insecurity, but kind of nutritional insecurity and uh, kind of micronutrients and you know those kinds of things. And I wonder if you this is just kind of as an extra thing. I, I wonder if you've ever come come across that or or, or you've thought about that as part of your uh, um, yeah work. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I guess uh, in terms of whether this is a capital, I mean, it is definitely a capitalist diet. But then again, uh, if you think about, you know, I mean, capitalism has been around, I'd say, since about 1700. And uh, if you go by the kind of studies of uh, Thomas Piketty, for instance, in terms of how he periodizes uh, the, the stages 
when capitalism has not simply deepened inequality, the only time when capitalism did not deepen inequality was from after the Second World War to the mid-1970s. And so that was also capitalism. And it didn't have the neoliberal policies that started in the 1980s. So I think this is uh, specifically neoliberal. Um, I mean, it is part of capitalism, obviously, but uh, um, I guess uh, I, I recently read a, a book review essay that I think is actually published in the Journal of Agrarian Change by Mark Tilsey uh, uh, that was in part critiquing my book. I mean, he seemed to agree with everything except for the fact that he found me reformist. And I guess I would have to plead guilty as charged because I mean, uh, I, I, I think I, I, I want to, uh, I mean, I, I locate myself in the real utopias perspective of my professor, Eric Golden Wright, who sees three different uh, strategies for transformation. The ruptural, you know, confrontational by violence, direct takeover of the state, smashing capitalism, et cetera. And that hasn't worked throughout the 20th century. And then there's the other end, which is the autonomist uh, strategy, which uh, looks, uh, you know, for the interstices of capitalism and, you know, try to uh, change the world without taking power, a la John Holloway, et cetera, et cetera. And well, I mean, then you run the risk of becoming marginalized. But I guess if that strategy becomes articulated to the third, which is the symbiotic uh, strategy or social democratic or electoral strategy, the reformist one, uh, which I advocate, then maybe you can look to changing the ecology in which capitalism moves and maybe you change it enough that at some point capitalism itself will be unrecognizable. I mean, that's my ideal, of course, right? <laughs> uh, so I, I think that's that's the, the kind of change that we should be moving toward. And um, I guess, I mean, you know, in, in the pre I, I didn't finish the idea a little while ago saying that the present government in Mexico declared officially neoliberalism officially over. I mean, it's one thing that they put it in paper but another that they implemented, right? But at least the will is there, you know, to end neoliberalism as the main policy guideline. And so that's why I think it's still important to use that. I mean, it's been the hegemonic policy around the world since the 1980s. And I think it's in crisis. It's already gone into the first crisis with the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. Uh, it's in a major crisis now, again. Um, so we need to move into different kinds of, of policies. How are we going to call them? Uh, that's a good question. I'll, I'll leave that as homework for Enrique. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's, that, is, that is one for, for everyone. But thanks. Yes, how to change the world, including the... Um, uh, the food machines. That is a pretty big question. Uh, Siduti, um, should we go to you now? Um, yeah. Hi. Um, I have a question, and it's more from my um, experiences after teaching in the US. So I have tried teaching issues of obesity and neoliberalism in classes, and students um, say that you need to debunk that because obesity is itself something that's been constructed and therefore they would rather um, you know you were talking about how the collective needs to come together but the, the newer generation here seems to be wanting to come as a collective around the body positivity movement where obesity needs to be questioned and it should not be related to food rather we should talk about obesity as how it is body shaming and individuals should have a right to eat what they want to and look like the way they want to so they are, they are very, very far from a food sovereignty kind of position. And there's a there's a significant social movement among younger population around that. So if that's how they are tackling the issue at hand, which is also very individualistic, um, you know, how do we take them to a corner? I mean, they're not think, looking at these structural issues here at all. 
So, you know, I, I would want you to reflect on, you know, how we can make it more effective, not just as a part of a course, but also to organize as a social movement. Right. Yeah, that's a very, very important question, uh, uh, Sejuti. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I was going to include some slides with uh, some uh, book covers on the different different perspectives that uh, predominate in the United States. And one of them uh, is what uh, might be called the social constructivist perspective on overweight and obesity. And there's a book called Pat So. Question mark. And it's a play of words, you know, fat so is a, like a derogative epithet for, for people that are overweight. Uh, but then uh, this person says, you know, fat and so, what do you care? Right. And, you know, they try to, to pitch the whole thing on a micro sociological interactive level of uh, meanings and significances and so on and so forth. And I think what needs to be done, I mean, this is a, a, a very individualistic perspective as well. I mean, I, I fully respect the intention of, uh, uh, of trying to avoid discrimination on the basis of uh, overweight and obesity and definitely uh, not blame the victims and so on and so forth. But I think we really need to articulate to a more objective kind of perspective. Uh, there's another book uh, that I, I like, but I think she fell uh, a little too much for this uh, constructivist perspective. And this is uh, Julie Guthman's book, uh, Weighing In. I think, uh, I mean, she goes as far as to say that uh, there hasn't been an increase in um, caloric intake in the United States. I mean, that's factually wrong. There has been an increase in caloric. I mean, I showed it here, right? There has been a considerable uh, increase in food intake. So I don't think, it, I mean, she also criticizes the, the BMI as an indicator, the body mass index, which, I mean, it is problematic if you use it on an individual level, because uh, for instance, a bodybuilder can appear to be uh, obese, but in fact, he or she doesn't have an you know, any grams of uh, fat in their tissue. So, uh, but on a population level, I think it's a, a pretty decent indicator. In fact, in my book, I do uh, corroborate the consistency of the, what I call the neoliberal diet risk index with um, uh, the BMA. And there's a very high correlation of about 0.8. And it is said in statistics that if you have a, a 0.6 uh, correlation or upwards, that means it's a very strong correlation. So um, anyway, I think uh, the constructionists need to ally themselves with uh, objective structuralist uh, analyses so that they can push for the kinds of policies that they need. I mean, that would be my, my recommendation, I guess. Thank you. So um, we, we are sort of getting towards the end of, of these sessions. We have to finish, be finished in five, 10 minutes. Uh, so, uh, but taking us there, I thought we could just uh, hear from Sarah if she has any final points or questions or issues she wishes to raise and, raise and then, Gerardo, you can you you can have the last uh, the last say in the discussion. Any points that you want to 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 emphasize towards the end, Sarah? Thank you, Jens. Uh, so just to say that I think that the point raised by Suzuki is so important, uh, and uh, yeah, like I think it's something uh, very fundamental to keep in mind uh, when we talk about obesity. How there are different perspectives about obesity, but beyond that. Uh, um, no, I mean, I just wanted to conclude by thanking Gerardo once again, and just to uh, perhaps uh, highlight a couple of things. So one thing that I uh, mentioned before that perhaps got a bit lost in the discussion is this idea of uh, thinking about uh, dietary change as a non-linear process, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, thinking more about uh, the kind of uh, processes that are happening in the contemporary world in different regions of the world. Uh, 
and also for different uh, socioeconomic groups. Uh, um, and I think that that is something that, uh, um, you know, would be an important area for, you know, all of us interested in pursuing research in, uh, in uh, these areas. Uh. Um, and then uh, perhaps, you know, like just in response to Shreya's question on, uh, can we just call it a capitalist diet? I think that uh, some further qualifications are needed because uh, these diets, has, I mean, our diets have changed a lot in the history of capitalism. And I think that uh, uh, there are some qualitative <coughs> dimensions that are becoming very important. Uh, and I think that Gerardo's uh, distinction between uh, luxury and basic foods is actually very interesting. And uh, um, perhaps, you know, like if there is time for you to come back on this question, I was wondering if uh, you have done any research on uh, how um, luxury and basic foods have changed over time and in different contexts, uh, because that is also something that explains uh, how there have been very significant uh, dietary transformations. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I, I have done a little bit of exploratory research on, you know, through time, but unfortunately I can't find adequate data for 1981, for instance, you know, to, to try to, because I think if we started in 1981, we would really be able to, to determine what used to be the traditional diet in Mexico. Uh, now, one empirical observation that I would make is that, uh, traditional Mexican cuisine is becoming extremely uh, famous uh, in some of the major capitals of the world, you know, with, with chefs that have these really high-end restaurants uh, pitching Mexican food, right? Uh, and I, I would bet that all that food is very nutritious and very tasty at the same time, right? Because I mean, one of the features of, of junk food is that it, it's tasty. It's not nutritious, but it's tasty like hell. <laughs> That's why it can be uh, risky even for the wealthier people that can choose the healthier stuff. Uh, and this, I think, uh, makes me come back to a question that I don't believe I answered about insecurity. What is food insecurity? Uh, I think that's a very good question because it used to be the case until the 1990s that food insecurity was primarily lack of access or insufficient access to calories. And what I say in my book is that, you know, that was the quantitative aspect of food insecurity. What we have now is a qualitative aspect of food insecurity in the sense that there are probably uh, and linking these with Rash Patel's book uh, on Stuffed and Starved, uh, we probably have an excess of calories, but they're highly compromised nutritionally. And so in that sense, we have a, a qualitative problem of food insecurity. And that, that's what we need to change. On that note, I will thank you Isirado, for, for this fascinating, interesting uh, 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 seminar, webinar, that I think we have learned a lot from and, and given us food for thought. And also thanks to you, Sarah, of course, for, 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 for sharpening the arguments and, and contributing yourself to my co-organizers, Shreya and, uh, and Enrique, and to everyone that have taken part. Uh, thanks to everyone. Before I finish, let me just uh, highlight that we will be back next week, same time where we have Ray Bush from University of Leeds to talk on something different. Um, Egypt's agricultural transformation, farming without farmers. Uh, on that note, thanks to everyone and uh, hopefully see some of you next week. And yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll see Enrique in a minute. Yes, yes, you will. <laughs> Yes, that, that, that's correct. I, I just sent you the, the link, Gerardo. So okay. if you want, we can take, do you want to take five minutes? Oh, can we? Do sure. It? Yeah, just a washroom break. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll see you in five minutes then. Okay. Cristobal, good day. <laughs>